Welcome to today's talk at Google. My name is Mike Abrams, and I'll be moderating this wonderful panel today. Um, if you are watching the live stream, we will be take, taking questions at the end. So please add your questions throughout the discussion, and then we will get to them uh, at the end of our conversation. So let's get to our panel. We have an incredible group to talk about leadership in sports today. Our panelists are the author of The Catalyst Effect and current Butler University professor, Dr. Jerry Toomer, two-time NBA champion, Shane Battier, assistant coach for the Charlotte Hornets, Ronald Norred, and the managing director of men's basketball for the NCAA, Joanne Scott. So welcome, everybody. Hi, everybody. All right. Thank you all for being here. So, Jerry, I really want to kick things off with you since the Chaos Effect, you know, the book that you wrote is really the main reason we have this wonderful panel together. So how did you decide to tackle writing this book? And then, you know, you covered a lot of different examples from musicians to athletes to business owners. How did you come up with the examples for, for this book? You know, great question. First of all, it's a pleasure to be with you, Mike, and, and especially with Shane and Joanne and Ron, because they all feature it in some way in the book. And they've been sparks for the book in their own ways. Uh, the idea for the book really came out of my understanding of leadership occurring uh, at more than just the top level of an organization or a team. You know, the, the team captain, the CEO, the conductor of the orchestra are all very, very important, obviously, to the organization. But a lot of the leadership that occurs in any of those organizations take place, it takes place in the middle. It takes place uh, among the technical professional people, the athletes, the musicians that play in their sections and do their piece. So uh, with that in mind and having had some experience in business, arts and, and music, uh, a real spark, uh, the guy sitting here with us today is Shane because the Michael Lewis article, the No Stats All-Star back in 09 kind of really said, yeah, yeah, that's really it. Uh, who around you makes everybody else better? Who on the team when they, when they step onto the court, onto the field, into the conference room, onto the stage brings a set of competencies that that makes the team and everybody else individually around them better so that's the research question that we really started off with and then we did 90 plus in-depth field interviews in those three sectors sports arts and business came up with 12 competencies distilled those or group those into four cornerstones so that's the kind of the spine and the foundation for the book mike Awesome. I want to get into the no stats all stars. We'll get to that question because I actually do have that question for you, Shane. Um, but I do want to use your framework because um, you covered four corner cornerstones mm -hmm. for leadership as, as kind of how we talk about sports leadership today. So your first um, cornerstone is building credibility, which is acting with integrity, communicating clearly, and then invigorating with optimism. So I think really the first question I'd like to ask Shane and, and Ronald for you two as, as players, you know, Ronald's a point guard and starting your, you know, every game your freshman year. And then Shane, you played on multiple different teams. How did you establish credibility early on? So as a freshman or with a new team or with people that you haven't really worked with or met or played with um, to be, to be a credible teammate and be a leader? Well, well Ron, um, you know, I don't, I don't know about you, but uh, you know, as a, as a former athlete, uh, you know that there's nowhere to hide in the locker room. You know, the, the locker room uh, is one of the, the, the purest places that you can that you can, you can exist you know, during any team sport session. You spend more time with your with your teammates than you do your family and they see you at your at your most vulnerable uh, state. And so there, there's nowhere to hide. And so um, your teammates do a really, really good job of understanding who is about the team, who has purity of, of the mission and who does it who may be just a, a mercenary there for money or, or self gratification. Uh, and so it's really hard to fake that over a long period of time. You're, you're, you're found out very, very quickly. And uh, that, that's the advantage. I, I wish, I wish the boardroom, I wish, I wish the corporate setting was as, as transparent as, as, as the mm -hmm. locker room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, um, I, I was really fortunate to go to Butler. Um, and be at a place, you know, Shane was the no stats all-star. I was like the bad stats, like bad player. <laughs> and um, I was really fortunate to go to a place like Butler that um, valued, I'll never forget my freshman year. We're sitting down all as freshmen. It's like our initiation for Butler uh, freshman class uh, basketball players. And they give us a sheet that says no talent required. 
And I was like, hmm, this is interesting. And under that sheet, uh, under that headline, it named all these intangibles that you could control, your hustle, your communication, your spirit, your presence, all these things that you could control. And man, when I read that sheet, I was like, I got a chance. Like, I, I can play here um, because I wasn't the greatest shooter, wasn't the greatest ball handler. Um, I did defend well, um, but I thought I can be a leader um, on this team because I can control these these things, these intangibles, being the first on the floor. Um, and so I was really fortunate to go to a program that valued that. And because of that, I, I got the opportunity to start every game my freshman year. I averaged four points. I think I shot 19% from the three-point line. I think I shot 40% from the free throw line. I mean, just horrible stats. Um, but what I could bring to the table was valued, and it was bigger than just being the best player on the team. So, Julian, I think in, in your world, and you've been in a lot of large organizations, USA Basketball, Nike, and then the NCAA, how do you how do you kind of handle that in the professional setting um, in the world of sports of being able to establish your credibility very early on? Well, I, you know, I started off at USA Basketball and Mike Krzyzewski wrote a book called The Gold Standard. And um, that is something that I adopted when I was like 22 years old, because when working for USA Basketball, we went to work every day and we were shooting for the gold, not the silver, not the bronze, not that they're not a bad thing to shoot for. But when you're at USA Basketball, you're shooting for the gold. So everything we would do, we would say, is this the gold standard? Is this what you do for a gold medal winning team? So I learned that very young. Um, and then um, and my job at USA Basketball and in my job at Nike, I was exposed to Hall of Fame basketball coaches, you know, um, and I learned very quickly. They don't know no two coach the same, um, but they have a very comfortable atmosphere at their university. And then they would come to USA Basketball or Nike and have to trust you. Um, so they would have to I would have to travel overseas to a foreign country and when they would have nobody around them. That was their staff. So I had to very early on. Um, develop a relationship with them and authentic going back to what Shane said, you can't fake your way. People can figure that out in sports, but a very authentic relationship. But I would say, lastly, I ha you have to deliver results. People trust you when you deliver results. And I think my work ethic and my knowledge of the game delivered results to where they felt a comfort with me. So that's what I would say starts with gold medal standards and ends with um, delivering results. Uh, that's, that's great. So, Jerry, I think, um, you know, obviously we have people from your book on this panel, but outside of the sports world, what was your favorite example from the book that really that really hammered home this this cornerstone that's maybe outside the sports world that that you were maybe even surprised to see or something that you you were um, happy to uncover? That's a great question, Mike. Uh, let me pop into a corner of the arts world, and, and this is really interesting for those of you listening. If you've not done improv, if you've not been to an improv experience, or if you've not actually done improv, give it a try. Because when you're when you're just playing, I went through a, a, a live class experience last last fall. When 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 you play on stage, you have to trust the people around you that they're going to have your back. And it's all about yes and. It's all about building the other person up. And so it becomes, I trust that whether it's on stage or in the locker room or in the business conference room, I've got your back. I want to make you look better. And I'm not sitting there saying, yeah, but I'm not so sure about that. I'm there saying, yes, and I want to validate, Mike, what you said. I want to extend it and I want to build on it. And I want to do that to make the team better. So it's that kind of, I think, posture and attitude that, that goes into improv and the rest of the arts world, whether you're on stage or in the symphony and, and maybe a lot of the sports world as well. Such such cool stories in the book too to to read about from from all different facets. But let's transition to the second cornerstone, which is creating cohesion, um, connecting emotion, emotion emotionally, developing camaraderie, and then putting a team's goals before your own personal interests. And I think Joanne, I'd love to hear from you um, about this topic because you're working at a very large organization at the NCAA, putting on one of the largest events uh, like March, March Madness. So, what goes into keeping your team focused on the greater good of the entire event and the entire organization versus any personal interests. 
Well, as corny as it may sound, I use the one shining moment tagline. Um, we usually start a year and we play the one shining moment and we say, this is why we're all here. We can all enjoy what we want, but we're, we're here for these young gentlemen and, and their coaches to have the experience of a lifetime. So when they're doing a panel for Google in many years, they'll talk about the experience. So we always come back to, you know, their one shining moment. But what we do is um, what, I, what we do is we have strategic priorities. Um, we work with you know, cities and public safety and a lot of venues, you know, we have eight venues going during March and the final four venue and the city, uh, the convention center, it's a lot of moving parts. So we have strategic priorities so that folks make decisions that align with those strategic priorities. So we've developed uh, five strategic priorities uh, for the tournament. And then we ask people to make decisions that align with that. We assign buddies. For, um, and that's a big part of the communication on like, okay, you're a buddy in the venue and you're a buddy with our staff and you're a buddy with a local crew. So that the communication drop doesn't happen. Um, I, we use it a lot. I am very, I'm very fortunate to listen to a lot of athletic directors and um, oh, uh, Michigan State use a we are they line. They always say, well, they're not doing this. Well, we are they because we're all one team. Well, they're not doing this. Okay, well, we are they. So we use we are they. So if they're, if we see something, we're like, we're a team here. It's not them and us where we are they. So we use that line a lot. Um, you know, just to build a camaraderie, we meet for the final four, we meet three days a month. Everyone comes in, everybody. We don't let television come their own day. Everybody comes in. And we do speed dating, as weird as that is. Um, we sit down across from each other and we learn everything we can about all the folks I just mentioned, because I think that makes you understand it and helps you build the camaraderie. So those are just some of the few things we do. We I like to say we like to treat everybody as a family um, or a team, uh, but that's just kind of what we do, some some tips from behind the scenes. Those are those are really cool. And it sounds a lot like what you see with the a lot of the teams today have a you know a tagline um, with, yeah. with different ways to kind of unite the team. So Shane, I know you've been you hear the term glue guy a lot, and you've been called the ultimate glue guy. So I'm curious <coughs> to hear just your your take on that on that term and how you feel about it and how it kind of works within this cornerstone of the, of the framework. Um. Well, I take it as, as as a badge of honor and a little background about my story. When I was growing up in Birmingham, Michigan, um, my dad's black, my mom is white. So I was the only, only black kid in, in my, my school, okay? And I was one of two minorities, Eddie Toma and myself. And I was different from everybody. And I was a foot taller than everybody else. I was a different skin color than everybody else. Uh, but there's one place that I always belonged. And that was a recess on the kickball field, on the sand lot, on the basketball court. And I realized like, when I helped my friends win, they loved me and they wanted me around. So I became obsessed like as a kindergartner or as a first grader, not only just winning, but helping my friends win and feel good about what we what we do. And so what, it was never about like, I scored so many points. It was, hey, how, how, do, how do we do this? And, um, you know, after talking to Jerry and, and helping with the, the catalyst effect, you know, I was able to, to understand that better. But for me, it was just like, hey, well, what can we do to win? And that, that was my entire mindset throughout my entire basketball career was what can we do to win? Uh, because Hubie Brown, I played for one of the greatest coaches of all time, Hubie Brown, he put it succinctly. He said, look, when you win, you all go uptown on the same train, all right? And no one cares how many stats, how many points you scored, how many rebounds you grab. They just want to know, were you part of that team? And, you know, in this Instagram world, you know, I think a lot of young people get so caught up and well, you know, here, here's my resume, here's my stats. No, 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 that's that's the wrong way to frame it. You know, talking to Joanne, Joanne worked for USA Basketball, worked for Nike. It's like, wow, she, she was part of an amazing team. Ron was the point guard of Butler. Man, that, that, that's an amazing program. So when you're part, it doesn't matter what your stats were. It doesn't matter that Ron averaged four points. He was part of an amazing team. And that alone gives you tremendous value. And it's a differentiator with everybody else who's not part of winning teams. And that really kind of leads to, to Ron, to my question for you, as you know, you're now you've been a head coach in G League, you're now an assistant coach um, in the NBA. Do you change your co coaching philosophy based off the type of player that you're going to be speaking to, whether it's this quote unquote glue guy or a superstar or a bench player or a role player or whatever that is, do you, do you kind of, 
change how you approach, how you work with them, how you coach them, or what's that model look like for you as you're starting to, to learn more about your coaching career? Yeah, I think a big part of that, that whole thing, and it's, you know, Shane brings up a good point. Um, we're dealing with a different kind of kid, especially in the NBA. Like our guys have been quote unquote famous their whole lives because of social media and Instagram. So it's important for us, number one, uh, and, and me personally as a coach to really get to know the guys, like really get to know who they are, what they're about, where they come from, what makes them tick. Um, what do they care about? Like, do they care about being that guy that is just a part of a winning team? Do they care about more about the stats? And using that framework um, helps me understand how to coach the guys better. Um, because our job as a coach is, number one, is for our team to be successful and get the most out of our team. And obviously we need those individuals to do that, but we have to push those individuals by knowing who they are and what makes them tick, but also helping them understand who the other guys are around them, right? We're talking about creating cohesion. We got to know each other to be together, right? To push each other to be the best that we can be. And so um, it's a, it's a difficult thing. There's times like when we're in a film room and a question is asked to the team and everyone is just dead silent. Right. And so we have to do a great job as coaches of asking the right questions to pull the information out of the team. And I think when you think about creating cohesion, building a culture where it's player led and player driven allows you to build uh, allows you to build a culture where the guys feel committed to it, where they don't feel like it's just their coaches, you know, telling them this is the way we're going to do it, where they where they want to be cohesive because they had the input and they created the framework for your culture. So I know, you know, I did a horrible job of that my first year as a head coach in the G League. Like I, I had these really cute like values and, and things that I wanted to do a lot from Butler, to be honest with you. Great, great values from Butler that we had and try to put them on the players. Right. And it was a horrifically cohesive team. Bad. Right. And then and I learned from that, like, well, it was about me. I made it about me, not about them coming together. And so that second year, really trying to understand the players, get to know them, understand what they care about, what they were willing to defend to come together. Um, was something that was really important. So, Ron and Shane, you both mentioned the Instagram influence and just the the social media aspect of this. There's one that's kind of really taken hold of college basketball recently that I, I think is interesting. I'm curious to hear your perspective for, for all four of you is the bench mob, you know, the, the celebrations of the three-pointer and um, and dunks. They've kind of almost created their own thing the between them and Club Trillion and all these different pieces. Um, how do you embrace that? part or who's probably never going to see the floor in college or maybe just only at the end of a game, but also brings a lot to the team. Um, how do you, how do you feel about that kind of like taking off on their own personas and then also what they bring to the team? Uh, I guess I can go first. I personally love it. Like I'm all about those guys and you know, I was fortunate in my career to be a starter, um, you know, all the way up through my college career. And, you know, I didn't play after that. Um, and so I was never down there necessarily on the end of the bench with the bench mob. But I know as a, as a starter and a guy that played a lot, how much they gave to us and how much we fed off of them, right? Kind of leadership, like, uh, you know, and the catalyst effect. Like, we're talking about guys that, you know, to the outside world don't have a large effect on our team, but are the guys that are pushing us every day in practice. And so, to be honest with you, like, they would be – I'll never forget, they beat the starters in practice all the time, and then they talk trash to us, like <laughs> – they tell us all about it. You know what? They created that little cohesion themselves and pushed us as the starters to be to be even better, right? And then at the end of the bench, man, they're just down there celebrating, helping us, you know, bringing us energy. That was I, – I love it. I love seeing it in the NBA. I love seeing it in college. Um, you know, some people say sometimes they go too far. You know, it's college kids having fun. You know, let them have fun. <laughs> Well, I, I think I played on the ultimate bench mob team with the Miami Heat, and we, we had an internal joke that it was the big three of LeBron, D Wade, mm -hmm. and Chris Bosh, and the little twelve. All right, I, I was you know <laughs> part of the the little twelve that got a little less a little less shine, but you know I, I think that Eric Spolster, you know, and Pat Riley deserve a lot of credit because great leadership highlights everybody's contribution, and in many regards, we're all role players every one of us has a role and for us as a team to to reach our, our highest level everyone has to play their role to their highest ability you know so for for bench mob guys you know what it's going after the starters in practice it's talking trash to them getting them ready uh for others maybe a six man 
for others, it's going out and, and scoring 20 points and grabbing 10 rebounds. Uh, but we all have a role. And, uh, you know, the great coaches I play for, Coach K and Eric Spolstra, have highlighted, look, you know, do your job and do it to the best of your ability. And if everyone does that, it's going to be it's going to be something memorable and special. And uh, and so, uh, you know, when I, when I see great bench cohesion, um, it's fun. It's super fun. But it's also the acknowledgement that like, hey, yeah, we're, we're part of this and it all counts and it all matters towards the ultimate goal. Awesome. So let's let's transition to the third cornerstone, which is generating momentum, um, energizing others, upgrading skills, and then when to lead and when to follow. So, Jerry, I think you know we've talked about this before, but as we talk, as we think about upgrading skills, do you feel that the catalyst um, effect in the leadership that is a trainable, coachable skill? Uh, for sure. And you could debate, Mike, about whether whether all the competencies are equally as trainable as that one. Uh, you know, in terms of just basic personality and communication skills that you talk, we talk about on the first cornerstone. But when you get to upgrading your skills, that's a very voluntary, very willful decision. Uh, and it's a very human part of our human nature, right? We always want to get better. You grow. That's what we're hearing in part from, from the guys today and, and Joanne as well is it's all about getting better. It's being excellent. It's being excellent as an individual and as a team. That's wired into us. I think that's baked into us, and I think the way we express it is then very, very trainable. And I think then that's where the coaching comes in and where the commitment to being very specific about what it is I want to do to get better. Uh, and if you look at it through the business lens, uh, you look at Google or any organization, it's going to be very, very different a decade from now or five years from now than it is today. So the necessity of being able to adapt and change and being committed to staying sharp and being committed to being the very best you can be, because if you don't, um, you know, you're going you're gonna to lag, you're going to fall behind. So I think it's trainable, and I think it's something that we all need to be highly committed to. So I think, Shane, something you just mentioned, though, is relates to that. And I think, and Ronald, for you too, for, for both of you, when we think about upgrading skills and really just being able to do your job and, and do your part of the role. What do you do in your current roles as a coach, as you know, director of player development in this type of situation where someone used to be the star, used to be the one scoring 20 and 10, and now has to kind of embrace a different role? How do you approach those yeah. conversations? How do you help them um, be able to adjust their role on a team? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great question. Um, it's hard. It's hard because not only for athletes, and I, and I went through this through retirement where I, I struggled when I retired, there's always a fight for relevancy. And so whether you're the star player and you all of a sudden come off the bench or you're a player and you retire or you're the former board member and you're the ex-board member now, uh, people place a value on, on, their, on their titles. Um, but with that comes an amazing self-awareness that if you understand sort of the, the process and understanding that we are all are all just role players and my role changes and shifts you know nothing nothing is forever and, there, and everything is always always um changing uh, but it goes back to building credibility the people that handle um i'm not even gonna say demotion but a change in roles are the the people that understand the team dynamic and if you don't if you don't get the team dynamic you're not going to handle the change well and it's about having uh, uh, intellectual humility that okay my role is different but how can i make this the best it can be and if you have if you know if, you, if you're a, if you're a learner if you're a lifelong learner you can handle transitions because you look at it as a challenge not not a demotion and if you think you know everything you're going to struggle <laughs> with the change in role yeah i, I don't have a ton to add there because uh Shane said that really well, but this is definitely the challenge that we face um, in the NBA, right? Like the guys that we have, a lot of them are coming in as freshmen. They are the best player on some of the best teams in the country. They've been the best player their whole lives. And now they're coming to a team where everybody's pretty good. And um, there's already a guy that's on the team that's averaging 20 points a game, which is what they did on their past team. Um, 
and trying to help them, number one, define their role, help them understand what skills translate from what they've done to the NBA, right? To make them feel like that fight, they don't have to fight as much for relevancy. Like you, you, you're relevant because these skills that you had in college translate in this way to the NBA. And, and trying to help young guys figure that out is like, it's the name of the game. There's some, you know, that right away um, and that are the best players on their team, even when they get to the NBA. But for a lot of them, and I know there's some guys on our team that are young, that are, that they're fighting that battle a little bit, try to figure out, am I still relevant? And so for us as a coach, it's important for us, again, it goes back to the relationship and knowing them well um, to help them understand, yes, you are relevant to our team and here's why, here's what you can contribute. So John and Jerry, you've been exposed to a lot of different organizations and I, I want to hear which ones have you s felt have done the best job at giving employees, giving teams, giving players the opportunity to continuously improve and what have they been doing that separates them apart? Well, I've, um, I've been around college basketball all my life. Um, and um, when you're around college basketball coaches, every time you speak to one of them, and I, and I think this is why I am where I am today, and you ask them how they're doing the grind, just trying to be a better coach, trying to get better players. I'm trying to make my, better, my players better, uh, and I'm trying to be a better team. And, and so every year, I think even in college basketball, just like Shane said, if you're a senior, you got a freshman coming in that can, might be – might outplay you. Um, the work world isn't like that, but I always took that model and I applied it to my life that there's always going to be somebody coming up to push me that might, you know, be able to outperform me. So I think college coaches um, have done a great job of, you know, in the world of college basketball of like, just like giving folks the continuous improvement, you know, because that's what you want to do every day. The other piece I would say is would be Nike. I went to work every day and, you know, you were, you'd say, oh, we did so great on this. Let's, let, let's just like do it version 2.0. And they'd be like, nope, onto something better. You know, they would do a new version of a shoe, but it would change and they'd make it better. And continuous improvement was how do we make an athlete help an athlete win a gold medal? Or how do we make an athlete, you know, run a fat world, break a world record? So every day you went to work, you were like, how do you make it better? How do you make it better? So those are the two I can come up with. Awesome. And Mike, so I'd add, I had the, the privilege of, of helping put a, a two companies together into a, a joint venture, became one company. So the ag businesses of Eli Lilly and Dow Chemical uh, came together in the 90s and and our parents were really lovely in this regard because they said, go to a blank sheet of paper and build this business. You know, we were still owned by them, but the culture and the way we worked, our work processes were ours to build and own. And there are very few times where you've got that blank sheet of paper to go in and say, what do we want to create? And we did that with a group of four to 5,000 people over the period of about three or four years. Now, did everybody have as much of a voice as a CEO? No, but everybody in some way touched the formation of the values and the formation of the processes that we've used. So I think it, I think it's important for people to step back every once in a while, whether you're a coach or an NCAA, NCAA executive and just say, hey, you know, let's take us take us some space and step back and say, have we built what is ideal for what we're doing now? and not just continue, as Joanne said, to just incrementally improve. Perfect, so let's go to the last uh, cornerstone and, and Shane, this is, it's amplifying impact and it's pursuing ac excellence, mentoring and coaching, and then imaginative solutions. So I think I wanna to get to the no stats all-star question here for you. Um, now, in today's game, there's a lot more stats. So there's usage rates and PER and plus minus and wind shares and everything else. With all of those advanced analytics that are now part of the game, does that give the you know the points, rebounds, assists, blocks, steals type of player? Does this give you as the no set all star more to kind of lean on, more to look at, um, or is this still something that is a little bit more that you can watch and play, and you got to know, and you don't see it on the box score in any of these advanced analytics? <laughs> Well, well, the funny thing about all of these advanced analytics, and I'm now currently the, the vice president of analytics for the Miami Heat, uh, th there's just more ways to measure players. Um, but if you ask any basketball coach, uh, they know who can play and who can't. 
And that's that's the name of the game. Can you play? Can you help us win? Right? And in whatever form that takes. And that that's a formula that will never change in team sports. Now, how we measure it will we'll change. Um, and so, like, I didn't know anything about analytics before I got to the Houston Rockets. And I learned from Daryl Morey and, and Sam Hankey, who were the originators in, in, of analytics and basketball. Um, I just played. And I, I played to just stay on the floor. Like, I wasn't trying to be an analytic darling. I wasn't trying to, to intentionally do things. Oh, this is a really efficient play. Like, I was just trying to, to make plays and make enough shots so I would earn playing time and, and try to maximize my, my NBA career. And I just happened to be the things that I did and I figured out unconsciously were the things that helped teams win games in a really unmeasurable way. And uh, after going to Houston Rockets in 06, I learned some of the things that I did through, through analytics um, and, and, it, and they made sense to me. Um, but the old school values in, in basketball of diving for loose balls, taking a charge, making the extra pass, hustling back in transition defense, right? Being a great communicator, being a positive influence, being enthusiastic. Like those are all things that you can consciously control and they help your team win. Um, and so a lot of people get, get distracted by the form data analytics takes and, and the names and maybe some, some of the arcane models that, that, are, that are out there now. But bottom line is, what are you doing as a player to help your team win? and make your team more efficient and give yourself a chance to create conditions where you have success. And that's, that's all analytics are. So um, while the, the methods are, are intimidating and scary sometimes, it's pretty basic. Can, can you play? Can you play? Can you help us win? So I want to open up to audience questions. We've got a few here. But before I do that, I'd love to hear from all of you on what advice would you give to this audience? So people who are aspiring to be strong leaders for their own organizations, what advice do you give us? Um, I, I'll go first. Um, I think I'm definitely still on this path in a large way, but through uh, a couple failed experiences as a head coach, um, understanding who you are. Like to me, you know, I, I thought I knew who I was when I stepped into a head coach role and, you know, after the first game getting beat by 40 and, you know, losing 30 something games after that out of 50, um, I realized through that I, I didn't quite know who I was, what I valued. Um, and so understanding who I am allowed me to at least build a framework um, that allowed me to create a culture um, that I know that I could help other people succeed in. And I think without that self awareness, I mean, the things that Shane just talked about is for him as a player, like this was amazing self-awareness that he had. And I think I improved as a leader when I failed, number one, but number two, took the time to understand who I really am and what I really value. I'll go next on this one. Um, just like this panel, I'm usually the uh, only female in the room. Um, and it, I, it's, it's just what I know. Um, but what I would say is I just did it my way. Um, and I didn't try and be somebody that I thought I should be. Um, and I'm going to go back to, I just tried to deliver results that gained trust that let me lead. And so I just, but, but I think probably if I had to say, having been the only female in the group, I also self-reflected a lot. If I would self-reflect and say, was I the best I could have brought? Was I the best I could have been? Not in an insecure way, because there are some folks that get a little paranoid that way. Just, um, I was always probably my, my toughest critic, um, but I didn't try and be one of the guys. I just embraced who I was. There's a, there's a question, that's great. There's a, there's a question that I use in, in our MBA class that's an advanced leadership class that we actually just finished. And, the operating question for really the foundation for the class is why do you lead the way you lead? So what, what is it about leadership that, that you know? Who have you read? Who's been an influence? Who shaped who you are as a person emotionally when you were growing up? Was it a coach? Was it a teacher? Was it a parent or a brother or a sister? 
And then what do people see when they watch you lead? What, what behaviors do they see you doing? And, and having, back to Ron's comment, having a, a really good awareness foundation of those three things, I think is very, very important. So anything you can do to gain that awareness of why I lead the way I lead from those three, three lenses, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral, will help you. And I mean leader, not just in with formal title, right? Because everybody that's listening to this call is leading in some fashion on their teams. So what is it that you would say in the elevator when somebody asks you, Mike, why do you lead the way you lead? Um, you know, I, I probably owe uh, Jerry um, a royalty for every uh, every speech that I do publicly and uh, in charge for because I, I use a lot of his materials from the catalyst effect in my, in my speech. And um, my advice to, to leaders and really anybody, anybody out there is that instead of focusing on what you can't control um, or getting caught up in, in what you what you may not have in your arsenal right now. Focus on the things that you can control, but control those to the 100th percentile. So we're talking about your humility. We're talking about your selflessness. We're talking about your desire to see others do well. We're talking about your enthusiasm. We're talking about having a high EQ. We're talking about your listening capabilities. Do you use laughter to diffuse situations? Are you ready to perform? Are you prepared? Like that has nothing to do with where you went to school, where you grew up, what side of town you live on, those are all things that everybody can can focus on and control to the hundredth degree, the hundredth percentile. And if you make that your habit, I don't care what walk of, you know, what line of work you're in, what what your title is, you will be valuable. People will want to be around you, they want to follow you because those are our virtues. They're virtues. And who doesn't want to be around virtuous people? Um, and so I, I stole that from the catalyst effect, but I, I believe that before I met Jerry, um, but <laughs> control the things that you can control, but control them to the hundredth percentile. Mike, can I make one, one more thing? Because Absolutely. And Shannon, you say as an example again, but like I think about as when I'm not actually like the leader, like the top leader, right? Um, the kind of people that I want to follow and people who are willing to just give themselves up in whatever way that is um, and just take care of the people that they're around. Um, I know I feel like that's a person that I want to follow the people in my life who have done that, um, who constantly think about others and how they can impact others. And I, you know, this is the catalyst effect, right? But um, you know, Shane did that as a player. Like he, he just gave him, he physically gave himself diving on the floor of a loose ball, taking charges, these kind of things. Like those are the kind of people that the rest of his teammates can say, man, that's the kind of guy that I want to be around. Um, and so I think that's, that's really, really important when we're talking about leadership is the service mentality of it. Amazing. So thank you all for sharing. Um, we're going to take a few audience questions. So the first one we have is from Michael, which is, do you use a framework to engage with the player whose lack of commitment holds back the team or is each case approached differently? And on what frequency do you and the player check in on that issue? My guess is that's, that's at me. <laughs> um, do I use a specific fr framework? Um, probably not. Um, I definitely kind of approach each one differently. Um, and again, I think, I always use a relationship. Like when I'm talking about working with a player, developing a player skills on and off the court, um, understanding what they value and using what they value to help them see how that fits into the team, I think is so important. Um, otherwise it becomes about you. And if it's about you, especially with, with the players that we work with, the NBA players, um, if it's about you as a the coach, they'll just write you off. Um, so trying to help them understand Maybe they don't even know who they are, or what they do value, but trying to help them get to that point and see how that makes sense within our team framework um, becomes really important. And the other thing is there's a player that I'm going to my third year with the Hornets. There's a player that we're still working that through. Like it, it's, we're doing it, but it's not happening overnight. So we're still just pressing forward to try to help him understand what that means. 
Hey, Mike, let me add one thing here. Being on the basketball side of things, just to what Ron said, I try and apply what a coach did probably with Ron and Shane, with their coaches. When we're done with a large event, we're big. I try and just after a game, give feedback. And like, this is what I want you to improve on before the next game, or this is what you did really great. Keep doing it. And then just like the end of the year, people hate end of the year reviews. They just despise them in the corporate <laughs> world. And I try to do the same thing. Like what does coach tell you to from one year one to year two? This is what I want you to work on over the summer. This is what maybe you, you know, you did really great on. So I use that same kind of concept of coaching in those kinds of conversations. It's a great teaser for our next question which is from Owen, and it is, do you find that reflection plays a big part in what it takes to win? Um, when you're all on the same train uptown, are you looking back on what was the key piece to that puzzle? Well, I'll, since I'll go and then I'll hand it off. Um, but um, I think, I wish I had more time to reflect. I used to have a lot more time to reflect now, because I do lead so many folks, I, I, I find myself reflecting more and I wish I had more time to reflect. Um, but it's, I think it's like coaching. I'm going to go back to coaching. You have to read your team. Some coaches need more. Some, some players need more. Some players don't need more. You have to read your team when you can, you know, when they're on a roll, when to call a timeout, when you're not to. I just use coaching so much in my day to day life. And I think reflection, studying film, whatever you want to say, however you want to call it is a big part of the success. I, I really agree. And reflecting and watching film, uh, thinking about um, how the project went, why things went well, why they didn't go well, and also flip flip the idea a bit of, of feedback and who's responsible for, for the feedback. And if we get stuck in the mold that it's your boss or it's only the coach, then I think we don't improve as much as we can. I'm I'm responsible for seeking the feedback I need to get better. And if I can build that kind of mentality in the team that I'm working with in business or in sports, then I've got a better chance of everybody taking that responsibility to improve their skills and get that kind of feedback from peers and from the coach to get better. I probably have a little different perspective on that. I, I was a very, very poor reflector when I played uh, because, you know, one of coach K's biggest mantras was next play, next play, next play. And we didn't, we didn't celebrate our wins as much as we probably could have. And we didn't lament our losses as, as, as much as, as we could have. And we threw everything that we had onto what was the most important thing. And that was a thing that was right in front of our face. And so I, I now that I'm a little older, have a little more perspective. I wish I would have reflected a little bit more and and, and enjoyed and and learned. I think there was a time for for, for reflection, uh, but when you're when you're in the in the grind, you know, in a, in a basketball season, you're just you're looking to Tuesday night. Okay, what do we have Wednesday night? What do we have Thursday night? And you're just you're just trying to you're just trying to to, to gain real estate and and win that night. Um, and so, but I, I I do think as a leader. Uh, you need to find time for quiet reflection to say, okay, well, is this what I what I have planned? Uh, but it, it, it takes effort. It takes a lot of intention. So we have one more question, and it is from Alex, which is, who was the best leader that you ever played or worked with, and how did they differ from others? And so I'd love to hear from everybody. Um, I'll go first. Um, Brad Stevens. Um, who's now the, the head coach of the Celtics. Um, and I mean, I, I have an interesting uh, relationship with Brad. I played for him at Butler. Um, and then uh, he hired me when he uh, got the job with the Boston Celtics. And so, you know, you come as a freshman, you have this idea of what a coach looks like, a college coach. And we didn't have a, I mean, we had interactions in my freshman year, but it, it built to my senior year. And then when he hired me at this, as a Celtics, he didn't give me a job that paid me enough money to actually like live in Boston. Um, so that's his fault, but I lived in his house and I lived in his basement. And so this guy that I knew as a player and a coach, we became closer. Um, and then that relationship really grew as I was in his house with his kids and I was working for him now as opposed to playing for him. And I mean, I talked about the servant leadership before this guy's incredible. Um, the humility that he walks with on a day-to-day -day basis, 
Um, I'll never forget someone asking him if they wanted, you know, when he got the head coaching job at the Celtics, if they wanted uh, someone to get his bag from the plane to the car. And um, most people were like, yeah, the head coach, and me a head coach, yeah, I'll have somebody carry my stuff. And Brad's like, he didn't even think about it. He's like, I can, I can carry my bags and walk to my car just like everyone else has to do off the plane. And that's just an example of the humility that he lives his life with uh, in every day. And the players see that. Um, and they know that and they know he's about that. And as a result of that, he, he can get the most out of players because they know he's humble and he's there to serve them. He's there to give his best for them. And I felt as a player, I saw that when I was working with him, I saw it in his house with the way that he treated his, his wife and his kids. Um, it was just an amazing opportunity for me, um, to learn from him. I wish I would have been good enough to play for Brad. It would have been, been a pleasure. He's, he's a fine guy. And Brad was an influence for this book as well, by the way, because I sat with him in, in his coach's office several years ago and said, does this idea have legs? And we talked about the Butler way and we talked about coaching and he validated that it did. So he was a real supporter and an inspiration for me to do the research and write the book. Let me give you a really quick example from a different setting. So when I worked for a, a guy who was an Oshocks Texan, Aggie, uh, who was our CEO, who, who did not light up the room. You know, you, you really didn't want to put John in front of a group of 300 people on stage because he couldn't inspire much of anybody from the microphone. But I tell you, the, the things he did around the competencies that, that we describe, around trustworthiness and all in for the team and every day getting better and being honest with you and giving you feedback were just exemplary. So yes, he had that flaw. And, and you asked earlier, are these things trainable? John, we were never going to make John a great orator, but he could be clear and concise. And boy, he was so good on the other things that he was a wonderful human being to work for. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to cheat and say, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's close between uh, coach K and, and my dad. You know, my, my dad was uh, passed away about a month ago and he was my, my favorite coach of all time um, because he was there. Never taught me how to hold the basketball or how to throw a curve ball, but the things he demanded out of our team, um, we hustle on and off the court that we cheer our teammate, the, the last guy on the bench, like we, we cheered our, our best player. Uh, we, that we showed amazing sportsmanship that we um, just gave our all every single day. That's the only reason why I think I, I made it as long as I did in basketball with those lessons. And that, that was, that was the origination of the most that all-star. And uh, my dad was, he was always there. And that's probably the, the, the best part of leadership I learned from him. He was present when he was there. He was there. And of course, Coach K was, you know, an amazing uh, leader of men and, and coach and um, just his ability to understand people. And in a, game, in, a, in, a, in a team situation, I've never been around a person that takes so much time to understand, appreciate what makes each person on that team tick. And he, he was able to find that button for, for every guy. Now, some guys, they needed a kick in the pants every single day. I'm not going to say who. He gave him a kick, a kick in the pants every single day. Uh, for other people that, uh, you know, needed some mental jujitsu like I did, he gave me mental jujitsu. But he, um, he understood what each person needed uh, to, be, to be their best. And he, that's why he's been so successful for over 40 years. That's tough to follow because I was going to say my dad too, Shane. Um, so, but I agree with all of that, you know. Uh, and um, I think in sports, especially as a, as a female um, who, you know, Title Nine hadn't been in that long, hadn't been in place that long. My mother pushed us because she didn't get those opportunities. But my dad didn't. He wouldn't must be victims, you know. Unless somebody comes home and complains about the coach or complains about your teammate, and he'd say, you know, find a solution, you know. And I'm not talking to the coach. You figure it out. Um, and he taught us all those life lessons, but he always, he, he's the one that probably instilled me from very early on how to get better every year. So I would say my father, definitely. Well, thank you all for sharing and being here and taking the time to talk uh, about sports leadership with us. This has been an amazing panel.